，科贝尔牧师今天要带领我们一起来思考智慧与愚昧一线之隔，性格矛盾的所罗门。第三堂，何处是敬拜的所在？邀请你预备圣经，与我们一起翻开《列王记上》六章八章五十四到六十一节。让我们带着祷告的心一起来聆听。Well, welcome back、uh, for our third session on the life of Solomon, and、uh, let me just kind of introduce you to some place. I would encourage you to look it up online because it's pretty impressive. It is the largest private residence ever built in the United States. It was built by George Vanderbilt II. To be his summer house, to be his vacation home, and he chose the mountains of North Carolina, western North Carolina, near a town called Asheville. And he had constructed this house called the Biltmore Estate, the Biltmore Estate, and it is huge. I mean, when they were building this thing, they were having to manufacture bricks on site to build this, and they were manufacturing like thirty-two thousand bricks a day. Thirty-two thousand a day to build this crazy thing. It ended up having two hundred and fifty rooms. It has thirty-five bedrooms, and get this: forty-three bathrooms. Forty-three bathrooms. So, out of two hundred and fifty rooms, seventy-eight of them are bedrooms and bathrooms. It ended up having a total of almost a hundred and eighty thousand square feet. Now. I don't know what that works out to in metric. Somebody can pull out a calculator and figure that out. But whatever it is in metric, it's big. 180,000 square feet of floor space, livable floor space in this house. Again, the largest private residence ever built in the United States, and it was built by a wealthy tycoon whose money had been made, I think, through railroads and stuff like that. So. Whatever that's not really significant. The significance is in the massiveness and the significance of the building project. Centuries before George Vanderbilt II decided to build this monument to his own whatever,、um, another building project took place that was much much more important. And though while it's not physically near the size. Of the the building project of the Biltmore, it was of much greater significance and importance, and that was Solomon building the Temple of God in Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting is you go all the way back into the time of the Exodus in Deuteronomy chapter twelve. God had said, "I will select a place where you will come to worship me. I'll pick that out," and that place ended up being. In Jerusalem, on a place called Mount Moriah. Now we're first introduced to Mount Moriah in Genesis 22, when God tells Abraham to take his son Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice, a costly sacrifice. I mean, Isaac was the son of the promise. God had said, "Through you, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed, Abraham, and it's going to happen through a son who's going to make for you a great nation." Well. That great nation was all wrapped up in that one son, and God said, "I want you to take him and sacrifice him on a place I will show you." And that place was Mount Moriah. Years later, when David had sinned by counting the people and the soldiers and all that, apparently for his own ego,、um, God brought a pestilence, a judgment upon the land. The prophet came to David and said, "Here's how you can break this thing." Go over here to this place and offer sacrifices, and see if it doesn't forestall the judgment that you brought upon the nation. And he went to a place called the threshing floor of Ar now the Jebusite. Ar now the Jebusite. That threshing floor where David was going to sacrifice, Ar now said, "You're the king. It's yours. I give it to you, and I'll even give you everything you need." And David said, "No." Shall I sacrifice to the Lord that which costs me nothing? No. That threshing floor, we're told later, was Mount Moriah, the same place 
where Abraham had been called to offer a costly sacrifice. Now David was there to offer a costly sacrifice, and it is on Mount Moriah where the temple would be built and where generations of sacrifices would be offered, sacrifices to pay for the sins of the people and cover them for a year of atonement. This is a, a, a important location. It's part of Jerusalem, but it's also this Mount Moriah, this former threshing floor, which becomes the site upon which the temple is going to be built. So to come to the building of this great temple uh, for, for the worship of God by the people, we turn to 1 Kings 6. And it says, Now it came about in the 480th year, after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. Now, 1 Kings 6 verse 1 sounds like it's just kind of unnecessary data being thrown at us. It's actually a hugely important verse for Old Testament historians because it plants a stake in the ground as far as chronology and timing and establishing dates. Because of this verse, scholars can date Solomon's reign as beginning at about 971 BC and lasting until about 931 BC. So he would reign for about 40 years, 971 to 931. You say, well, how do they get that? They get it from verse one, 400 years after. And that ties back to the chronology and, and it gives them a base point to work from going backwards and forwards in establishing dates for different events throughout the remainder of the Old Testament. So it's a really critical verse for Old Testament historians, but it's also critical because it tells us in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, he begins to build the temple. And he, it will take seven years to build this temple. And we're given a description of it beginning in verse two. As for the house, which King Solomon built for the Lord, its length was 60 cubits, its width 20 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Now, a cubit is basically the distance between the tip of a man's elbow to the tip of his finger, or about 18 inches. Now, again, I don't know what that works out to in uh, metric. You can figure it out, but it's about a foot and a half. So that means that 60 cubits long is about 90 feet, and the 20 cubits wide is about 30 feet, and the 30 cubits high is about 45 feet. And so that means this is a much more modest building project than the one George Vanderbilt undertook. But it's much more important because the temple is going to serve a huge purpose. Now, even though it is smaller than the Biltmore Estate, which it doesn't really matter, it's twice as big exactly as the dimensions of the tabernacle, which the children of Israel had built and established in the wilderness and had carried with them into the promised land. It is exactly twice as big, and it's going to not only be twice as big, it's going to be more substantial because it's going to be a permanent location. It's going to be a permanently built place, and Solomon is the one who's going to build it. Now, in First Chronicles, what we find out is that the plans and specifications and the pre preparation of all of the, the necessary components, all the building supplies, the timbers, the stone, all of that, David had already sorted all that stuff out. It's Solomon who's going to bring it all together into a physical three-dimensional reality as the temple of God. So they begin working on this place, and they begin working on it for a couple of reasons. One, its function is to be the center of Jewish life, Jewish national life. The temple, like the tabernacle before, it was the center of life. And in fact, the tabernacle was literally the center of life in the wilderness because when they would come to a stopping place, remember, they were led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And when those things moved, the people moved. But when they stopped, when that pillar of cloud or pillar of fire stopped, then they would stop. And the first thing they would do is they would set up the tabernacle symbolic of God's presence among the people. They would set up the tabernacle. Then the 12 tribes of Israel would be arrayed around that tabernacle so that at the center 
of the nation was the tabernacle representing the presence of God. This is also to be the center of Jewish life because it also represents God's presence among his people. Now, what makes that so interesting is that that means the temple was very important. And, and we see that, especially like in the book of Hebrews, how important the temple and everything going on there is. And we see that in the book of Revelation. Because right now there is no temple in Jerusalem, but in that day, the tabernacle of God will be with men. There will be no need for a temple because God and the Son will be among the people. But here, they build this temple and they build it to be the center of national Jewish life. And, and here's how profoundly true that was. In the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms is divided into five books. And you can see that in the headings in your translation of the Bible, uh, one through, I think, 42, then 43 through 70 something, and it keeps going. Well, within book five of the book of Psalms, there's a subset of Psalms called Songs of Ascent. There's Psalms 120 through 134. Now, why are they called Songs of Ascent? Well, because according to the Old Testament, Jewish people were required three times a year to go to the place of worship and celebrate important feasts. Israel had seven feasts that they celebrated. Three of them required a pilgrimage. Passover, first fruits, or what we call Pentecost, and tabernacles, or Sukkot. Each one of those had tremendous significance to Israel and connection to the Exodus story. Passover, because the angel of death passed over those who had sacrificed the lamb and put the blood on the doorposts and the lintel. He passed over and then Sukkot or tabernacles to remember that in the wilderness, they lived in shelters. They lived in tents. And so those feasts required a pilgrimage to the place of worship and the place of worship became this temple. So three times a year, people would make the pilgrimage and as they would go up, because Jerusalem was the highest location topography-wise in southern Israel, um, Mount Hermon was the highest in the north, Jerusalem in the south. So when it, from wherever you were going, you were going up, you were ascending up to Jerusalem. So as you were going up, you would be singing these songs. These songs, these 15 psalms of ascent were provided by the rabbis and collected and gathered by the rabbis into this special subset to be the songs that they would sing on their journey of going up. Still today, when Jewish people make a pilgrimage to the Bible lands, to the Holy Land, they refer to it as making Aliyah, going up. They're going up. And because the temple was the place of worship and the center of national Jewish life, that's where you went. But also it became a metaphor for going up because the temple represented the presence of God among his people. And so not only were you going up physically in terms of the topography of the land, you were going up metaphorically or spiritually because you were going up to the presence of God. So there's a lot packed into here. And there's a lot of important things for us to think about. Now, what's interesting is that once they begin construction on this temple, for the second time now, God comes and appears to Solomon. And it says in chapter 6, verse 11, Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying, Concerning this house which you are building. Now listen to this. He repeats the same thing that he had said the first time he had appeared to him. If you will walk in my statutes and execute my ordinance and keep all my commandments by walking in them, then I will carry out my word with you, which I spoke to David, your father, and I will dwell among the sons of Israel, and I will not forsake them. Again, this is another if then. This is another conditional promise. If you do this, then I will do this. If you don't do this, I'm not obligated to do this. This is a covenant promise where he is making a covenant with Solomon where Solomon has responsibilities to fulfill and God has responsibilities to fulfill. But if Solomon does not fulfill his responsibilities, God's not obligated. It's a conditional promise. We talked about that in our very first session. So here we have this really important 
temple, which is being built as a symbol of God's presence, as a center for, nation, for the nation's life, and as a place of sacrifice and worship on Mount Moriah. So what happens? Verse 37, in the fourth year, the foundation of the house was laid in the month of Ziv. That's the fourth year of Solomon's rule. And in the 11th year, the house was finished throughout all its parts and according to all its plans. So he was seven years in building it, seven years in building it. And again, keep in mind, David put together the plans and the materiel for the building. Solomon completed the building and brought it all together. So the work is finished in 1 Kings 6. An enormous amount of expense, an enormous amount of labor, labor costs and craftsmen, fine crafting, craft work, craftsmanship to be done in building this temple. It would have been a magnificent structure to the glory of God. And when it comes time to dedicate this, we turn to the, to the episode of worship that dedicates the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, beginning in verse 54. And I want you to hear Solomon's prayer of dedication. It says, And it came about that when Solomon had finished praying this entire prayer and supplication of the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread toward heaven. And he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel. According to all that he promised, not one word has failed of all of his good promises, which he promised through Moses, his servant. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us so that he may incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways and keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances, which he commanded our fathers. May these words of mine, which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel, as each day requires, so that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God. There is no one else. Then he says to the people, Let your heart, therefore, be wholly devoted to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as at this day. Now, this is really interesting because when God first spoke to Solomon, he said, if you will keep my ways and walk in my commandments and follow my statutes. The second time God spoke to, to Solomon, if you will keep my ways and follow my commandments and walk in my statutes. Now, Solomon takes that and delivers it to the people as well. Why? Why? Well, because this is a new beginning for Israel. When, when Israel came to Mount Sinai, it was a beginning point for them. They went from being this enormous extended family to becoming a national entity with laws and structure and social expectations and all these things. And when God gave them his commandments, they said to him, everything that you have said, we will do. This is the old covenant. This is the Mosaic covenant. This is the covenant where God promises to be their God and they promise to obey his laws and be his people. Promises made on both sides. Now we see a new beginning for God's people and it's not gonna be the last one. We'll see another one on Mount Carmel as the people have gone away from God and followed the Baal and, and they have to return to God for a fresh beginning at Mount Carmel. But here, at the temple. Solomon calls them to renew their covenant with God, a covenant of the heart. It's not just a covenant of commandments and obedience. Let your heart, therefore, be wholly devoted to the Lord our God, verse 61. Let your hearts be his. Again, this echoes David's song of repentance in Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, he says, sacrifices thou wouldst not, but a broken and a contrite heart. That's what you desire. God wants our hearts. He wants us. He doesn't just want our activities. He wants us. He wants us in relationship with him. But you know what? Today, we make the same mistake that many times they made in Israel. They became so committed to and connected to the temple as a facility, as a place, 
that they lose sight of the fact that ultimately they were called to be in right relationship with their God. So much of the time, church attendance and church activity seems to be the priority, but God's saying, no, the priority is relationship with me, a heart wholly devoted to me. That's what I long for. And in exchange, that he will not leave us and forsake us. One of the great statements in the Christmas story, and, and one of my go-to verses in times of difficulty and need, is in Matthew chapter 1, when Joseph is told, you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's exactly what Solomon's praying for here. May the Lord our God be with us. May he be Emmanuel. May he be God with us. Why? Because we need him. Because we need him so very, very desperately. We need him to be with us and alongside of us, to, to walk through life with us, to guide us and help us, to strengthen us and empower us, to protect us and provide for us. We need our God all the time. And so we need to live in the presence of God with us. And what Solomon prayed for, Jesus is. Jesus is God with us in everything that we do and in everything that we say and in everything that we are. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And truly, as Solomon said, he will never leave us or forsake us. That unconditional promise from Hebrews 13 that we saw in the first session. So important. So important that we never lose sight of the fact that it's not about religious deeds or religious service or religious activity. It's about living in the presence of the God with whom we have a relationship. The God who is our father and the God to whom we are his children. The temple symbolized God's presence with them. But the temple became the be-all, end-all, so that in John chapter 2, Jesus had to go in and cleanse out the temple. It's really fascinating. In all the Gospels, the first time it says Jesus made anything, it was a whip to cleanse the temple. And when they said, what gives you the right to do this? He looked at them and said, you tear down this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. That's a big claim. That's a big claim. And they said, how long did it take to build this temple? By that time, it was Herod's temple, which had already been some 40 years in construction and was going to be another 20 or 30 before it was done. And Jesus was talking about the temple of his body. Why? Because it's about relationship with him, our Savior, not just a facility or a building or activities or rules and regulations. It's about living in his presence and in right relationship with him, wholly devoted to the Lord our God. That's the call. And the temple that we worship at is not a church building. It's not a high place. It's not any kind of religious construct. It is actually worshiping in the presence of the living God who has made us his own. Father, thank you that you are our temple, that you are our place of worship, and that you are the one that we do worship. Lord, we're thankful for church buildings where we can gather to worship you corporately, but help us to not lose sight of relationship with you and a heart wholly devoted to you, because those buildings are just symbols, like the temple. They're just symbols. You are the reality. And so we come into your presence and ask you to help cultivate within us hearts of worship, hearts that are wholly devoted to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 第四堂, 你的灵命失衡了吗? 邀请你预备圣经, 与我们一起翻开列王记上四章二十到三十四节, 十一章, 生命记十七章十四到十七节, 让我们带着祷告的心一起来聆听。well, once again, as we find, as we begin this final session together, I just want to thank you again for joining us, for being with us, for being a part of this conference. And I also want to say a word of thanks to our, our Daily Bread ministry staff there in Jakarta. 
they do such a fantastic job, not just on events like this and other things, uh, in-person events there locally, but they just do a great job of trying to help people connect with biblical resources to help them in their relationship with the Lord. And let me just encourage you as we uh, begin our final study together for this time, uh, if there's any time you have a need for anything in your relationship with the Lord or in terms of a biblical study tool or something, please contact our office. I know that they would love to help you, and that's why they're there. So thanks for being with us. And again, a special thank you to our team there in Jakarta for the great, great work that they do. So now we come to, to number four. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're in New York City, August 7th, 1974. Now, I have to imagine that. I've never been to New York City. Probably you haven't either. If you have, you're way ahead of me. But on August 7th, 1974, the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center were not yet finished. And yet, as you walk down the street on this beautiful sunny day, you can't help but have your eyes drawn up to these giant towers that are being built in downtown Manhattan. And as your eyes go up, you see that it appears to be some kind of a cable linked between the two buildings. That's odd. Maybe it has something to do with the construction or the way they're building the upper parts of the towers or something. But then as you're looking and trying to figure out what that wire is there for, you see someone actually step out from the roof of one of the buildings onto that wire and make their way across to the other side. Now, if you stay there and watch what's going on almost a fourth of a mile above you, as you watch that, if you watch the whole time for 45 minutes, you'll see this person go across back and forth eight times. And along the way, there'll be times when they'll, they'll dance, they'll bounce around, the wave to the crowd below. I mean, I don't know about you. I have a real issue with height, heights. And uh, it's because I fell off a bridge when I was a young man. And so heights and me don't get along very well. I think about this guy up in that wire and it comes to me in one word. And that one word is, he's crazy. <laughs> this guy's just absolutely crazy. But the fact of the matter is Philip Petit, who is the the wire walker on that day, was not crazy. Although what he was doing seemed pretty crazy to me. Over years and years and years of training and practice and training and practice and training and practice, he had developed a highly attuned sense of balance. A highly attuned sense of balance. And that's what enabled him, even up there with the buildings moving and the wind swaying, to be able to maintain his balance on that wire. It wasn't something that he did in five minutes. It was something that was years in the making. Much in the way that any great skill is developed over years of training, whether it's football or piano or science or whatever the skill might be. It takes years of training to develop that skill. Balance is one of those really important life skills that takes years and years to develop. I mean, think about it in a physical sense. Think about that little child. The first time that little infant tries to sit up and they wobble around and then they fall over and then they try to sit up and they wobble around and maybe they last a little longer. And then eventually that little child takes its first very tentative steps. And then that little child's first tentative steps lead to walking and then to running. And then they have to learn how to ride a bicycle. And then there's a lot of skin, knees, and crocodile tears on failure moments. But then once it's learned, it's learned. And that balance is set. And then if we follow that little child forward, maybe someday we see them in the Olympics doing gymnastics, doing the balance beam. <laughs> balance is a hugely important thing in life physically, but it's also a very important thing in a world that is so terribly out of balance. We live in a world of abundance and excess in many cultures. I know here in the West, 
we live in a world of excess and it's so easy to lose your balance because there's so much, there's so much that you can access. I mean, even just think in terms of the internet and the unbelievable information to which we have access. Now, we know that we can't trust all that information and so we have to be very careful what we do with it. But the reality is just having access to that volume of information is an extraordinary thing. We live in a world of abundance. And in a world of abundance, it's really easy to lose your balance, to lose your perspective, and to maybe get dragged into areas that aren't always healthy. And that's where we come to in our final session, because this is where we begin to see the wise King Solomon sort of tumble off into some bad areas. And it's because he loses his balance spiritually. He has so much excess of everything that he loses his ability to have balance on anything. And we see that pictured in 1 Kings chapter 4, and then we'll see the result of it a little later in a different text. But notice it says in 1 Kings 4 verse 20, Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. They were eating and drinking and rejoicing. Again, that pictures the whole nation in a season of prosperity. And Bible scholars still today refer to Solomon's reign as the golden age of Solomon. Why? Because it was the greatest time of peace and prosperity that Israel would ever known. Their greatest time of influence, the time that they were the largest. I mean, Israel was a force to be reckoned with at this time during Solomon's reign. So what did that abundance look like? I mean, the people were eating and drinking and rejoicing. Okay. What did it look like for Solomon? It says, beginning in verse 21, Now Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. And they brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Who brought tribute? All these kingdoms. Solomon was not only ruling over the kingdom of Israel, but over all these other kingdoms as well. And his provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour and 60 cores of meal. Now, a core was a donkey load. Um, and, and again, in Western terms, I don't know what this translates to, but 30 cores would be about 185 bushels and 60 cores would be 375 bushels for one day, plus 10 fat oxen, 20 pasture-fed oxen, 100 sheep besides wild game like deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fat and fowl. For he had dominion over everything west of the river, from Tipshah even to Gaza, over all the kings west of the river, and he had peace on all sides around him. So Judah and Israel lived in safety, every man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. So when we start talking about abundance, we're talking about an extravagance of wealth on the part of Solomon, an extravagance of wealth, so much so that the queen of Sheba traveled just to see Solomon in all his splendor, the magnificence in which he lived in his house, the way he was dressed, the way his wives were dressed, the way all of these things were appointed. Solomon lived in extraordinary extravagance of wealth. And what we know is that even though it's not a sin to be wealthy, it is dangerous. It can be dangerous. I mean, the New Testament tells us that the love of money is at the root of all evil. The love of money is at the root of all evil. And when we get into this cycle of consumptive materialism, which is a term that we use a lot, especially here in the West today. When we get into this consumptive materialism, it can very much be a warning sign that we're getting out of balance with life. Out of balance with life. So there was extravagance of wealth that contributes to his losing his balance. But there's also a quest for security. Notice it continues, 1 Kings 4, 26 and Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots 
and 12,000 horsemen. And those deputies provided for King Solomon and all who came to King Solomon's table each in his month. They left nothing lacking. They also brought barley and straw for the horses and swift steeds to the palace where it should be each according to his charge. You say, well, okay, he's got a lot of horses. What's the problem? Well, first of all, on a practical level, taking care of him. I mean, we're told in the scriptures that Solomon built three cities just as chariot cities, just for cities to house the people who cared for the horses. Those were the cities of Hazor, Gezer, and Megiddo, cities just to look after the horses for his chariots. And you say, well, okay, what's the problem with having so many chariots and having so many horses? Well, we talked about this a couple of years ago when we looked at the life of Elisha, because he kept saying the chariots and horsemen of Israel. That, well, chariots in Solomon's day and in the ancient world were kind of the cutting edge of military technology. Today, the cutting edge of military technology is probably drone warfare. Well, back then, it was the chariots and the horses and the horsemen who drove them that were the cutting edge of military technology because the one who had the best and the most chariots had a decisive advantage in combat decisive advantage in combat. And looking to that military edge for security was a danger point that was warned against in Deuteronomy 17. Listen to Deuteronomy 17 verses 14 through 17. When you enter into the land which the Lord your God gives you and you possess it and live in it and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me, which they did. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your countrymen. You shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. Moreover, he, the king, shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. He shall not multiply wives for himself or else his heart will turn away, nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. All of this is about where do you find security? Multiplying horses was looking to the horses and the chariots and the military technology to be your security. Now, in today's world, smart nations have armies and they have them to protect the nation. And that's all well and good. But for Israel, God was always to be the point of their security. That's why the Psalm says, some trust in chariots, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in horses, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. One of the things that would differentiate Israel, yes, they would have an army, the king would lead it, but that's not where they looked for their security. They did not look for their security in wealth. They were not to look for their security in military. They were to look to God, their God, for their security. And so we have the extravagance of wealth that can cause you to lose your balance. We can have this quest for security that can cause you to lose your balance. But it goes even further with the pursuit of knowledge in 1 Kings 4, verse 29. Now God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of mind like the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezraite, Heman, Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol. And his fame was known in all the surrounding nations. He also spoke 3,000 Proverbs, a couple of hundred of which are gathered in the book of Proverbs. And his songs were 1,005, at least one of which is in the book of Psalms. And he spoke of, spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon, even to the hyssop that grows on the wall. So now he's into botany. And he spoke of animals and birds and creeping things and fish, ornithology and zoology. And men came from all peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth who had heard his great wisdom. But again, there's a dark side to that. There's a dark side to that. In James chapter 1, where we were told, as we saw earlier, that we can pray for wisdom 
and will receive her from the Lord. It says in James 1, 17, every good and perfect gift bestowed comes down from above from the Father of lights. The, the danger in the pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of wisdom is that we can try to find significance in our learning rather than to have our significance and our identity in our God. All this stuff comes down from God. It's good. It's not evil. It's not bad, but it's not best. Jeremiah 9, 23, 24 says, let the one who boasts not boast in his wisdom or in his knowledge or in his might or in his power, but let him boast in this, that he knows and understands God. That's the priority. It's not a matter that these things aren't good. It's not, it's not bad to have food, although the volume of food available to Solomon is, is crazy. It's not bad or evil to have a strong military as long as you don't place your security in that. It's not wrong to pursue knowledge as long as that's not where you get your significance. All of these things are things which in and of themselves are good gifts that are given to us by God, but all of these things are also things that can contribute to us losing our balance. We look for security today on a national level and military, on a personal level, in retirement accounts and, and all kinds of things so that one day we can have a nest egg of money that we can fall back on so that we're secure in our old age. Is that wrong? No, as long as ultimately we see our security in God. The answer to consumptive materialism and the quest for security and the pursuit of knowledge, the answer to that is not asceticism or living a life where we deprive ourselves of the good things God has provided. The answer to it is knowing when enough is enough. Can you have too much of a good thing? And Solomon's example tells us, yes, you can. You can very much have too much of a good thing when it makes you lose your balance. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment, knowing when enough is enough. Knowing when we don't need that bit more, that extra, that over the top something that's really not necessary. And this translates even further into Solomon's life in his pursuit, not only of wealth and security and power, but also in his pursuit of wives. And in 1 Kings, we see, let me find it here. In 1 Kings 11, now, King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh. His first wife was the daughter of Pharaoh. She was a princess, and his marriage to the daughter of Pharaoh formed a political alliance between Israel and Egypt. Okay, those, that was how alliances were done in those days. And it says he also, in addition to that, he loved Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, neither shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away with their, after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. Now, here's what that means. He entered into 700 of these political alliance marriages, 700 of them, 700 kingdoms with whom he struck an alliance through marriage. But then he had 300 concubines. These were kind of half-wives, and they were there simply to give sexual pleasure and satisfaction to Solomon. Now, you talk about losing your balance. I mean, couldn't somewhere along wife number 600, couldn't there have been this idea, okay, maybe I'm taking this a little too far. Maybe I don't need 300 concubines. That's almost one for every day of the year. I mean, think about that. A thousand wives. Sometimes too much of a good thing is too much. And it can cause us to lose our balance. And what's so interesting is that it says, it came about, verse four, when Solomon was old, 
His wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. Remember, we saw in that in that warning from Deuteronomy that not only were you not to multiply horses, you were not supposed to multiply wives either. Why? Because they would turn his heart away from God. Remember, when the temple was established, he said, we must be wholly devoted to the Lord. And he had been, but he wasn't anymore. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. And Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem for Moloch, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus he did for all his foreign wives, who turned, who burned incense and sac sacrificed to their gods. It's so ironic. We began by talking about a study in contrast. It's so ironic that the king who built a temple for the worship of true God now ends up building places of worship for these false gods. Even Molech, to whom they offered their children as burnt sacrifices. I mean, folks, Solomon has well and truly lost his balance here. He has lost his balance, and the end result is because is that the Lord was very angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him and commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. So the Lord said to Solomon in verse 11, because you have done this and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen." The kingdom of Judah would stay the southern kingdom headquartered in Jerusalem. The other tribes, except for parts of the tribe of Benjamin, would form the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, which would be headquartered in the city of Samaria. There are consequences to sinful choices. And Solomon's sinful choices that not only pursued extravagant wealth, to the point of excess, to pursue security apart from God himself, not only in horses and chariots, but also in these political alliance marriages. The Solomon who pursued knowledge as a way of building his own significance. This same Solomon who built the temple of God went so far off the rails and so far out of bounds, losing his balance spiritually through his multiple wives. God says, I'm taking the kingdom away. I was going to leave it in David's family, but it's going to now belong to one of his, one of your servants. And your son's going to have part of it, but it's not going to be anything like it was. This disappointing end is because the wise king became foolish because his heart was turned away. His heart was turned away by excess his heart was turned away by the pursuit of knowledge. His heart was turned away by his many, many wives. His heart was turned away so that he was no longer wholly devoted to the Lord his God. And that becomes a warning to us because we live in times of excess. I mean, we may not multiply hundreds and hundreds of wives, and I certainly hope you don't, but we live in times of excess abundance as well, where it's easy to lose our balance in the multiplication of things. Jesus said, your life does not consist of the things which you possess. Your life is to consist of your relationship with God first and foremost. Keep your balance. Learn the valuable lesson of contentment when enough is enough. And to that end, the hymn writer said, may the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day by his love and power controlling all I do and say. 
That's where contentment comes from. The mind of Christ being developed in us. I trust that this brief look today in the life of Solomon will be helpful and valuable to you and perhaps serve as an important warning that even the wisest of all men can become foolish when he takes his eyes off the Lord and loses his spiritual balance. Let's pray and we'll be done. Father, once again, thank you for this time of consideration of the scriptures. Thank you for each one who has joined us. I pray that you would teach us to draw close to you, to live in your presence, to find our security and our significance in you as your children and to maintain contentment and balance as we walk through a world of abundance and excess. Help us, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being with us.